Hey, good afternoon. This is Andy Mayers and Charlie Ch Chesbro. And we are very fortunate to be able to spend some time with you um, on behalf of the AFSA team to talk about some things we're seeing that's happening in the industry and how it's going to relate to auto finance. Um, by introduction, Charlie is a senior economist at Cox Automotive. You can hear some great insights from him. Um, and for myself, I'm the lender solution strategist dealer track. And you know, most of you uh, know him for a long time. Really sorry that we can't be in person and look forward to uh, getting back to where we can all be at a conference together. But in the meantime, we thought we'd take this time to share some thoughts with you. We have three main topics. Charlie's gonna go over the state of the industry and share with you some of the uh, trends we're seeing and what, what the impact of the pandemic's gonna be. And then we're gonna talk about some headwinds and some outlook for Q4 and beyond and how it's gonna affect our auto finance industry. And it wouldn't be, uh, presentation getting into November if you didn't do something about a presidential election influence. So we'll share some thoughts about the presidential election. I will tell you in advance that neither Charlie and I are predicting who's going to win the election. We're just going to share with you how that's going to uh, could impact consumer sentiment. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Charlie and let him go ahead and uh, share with you some of the thoughts. Well, Charlie and I are going to go off screen so you can focus more on the slides instead of us. Uh, enjoy. Thanks, Charlie. All right, well, thank you, Andy, and thank you to everybody for sitting in with us today. Let's start by talking about what's going on in the new vehicle market as we look at the next slide. We can see uh, what I'm starting with is showing the light vehicle sales SAR, and that's what that chart is there on the left. And we finished the month of September with the light vehicle SAR hitting 16.3 million, and that's the seasonally adjusted pace uh, on an annualized level. So we did most of last year at 18 million, so you can still get the sense that we're, we're still far behind where we were uh, last year, but we've got a nice V-shaped recovery going, as you can see in this chart. But there are some interesting things that we know have been going on in the marketplace. Uh, one, the worst of this pandemic happened uh, in April. Uh, vehicle sales were down significantly on a year-over-year -year basis, down almost 48% in the month of April. That's gonna be the bottom in this market. And we started a nice recovery since then, have recovered uh, you know, a little bit better every month uh, since we hit that bottom in April. Uh, the other interesting thing we're seeing is that car share continues to decline. We were already on a, on a multi-year trend of car share uh, falling in the market from a 50-50 just a few years ago uh, to now, you can see in the month of September, it fell to less than 23% of the market. Uh, this is a trend that looks like it's been accelerating a little bit during the depths of the pandemic, and that's a little bit surprising given that car products are in general a little bit more affordable uh, than their crossover counterparts. And you would think during a recession, uh, folks might be seeking ways uh, to save money. But the other interesting thing, if we look on the next slide, is that where sales are coming from uh, has been changing quite dramatically. And this is a slide that's looking uh, at the new vehicle market for the different channels. And we have retail purchasing, which is uh, folks like you and I going out and buying a vehicle. Of course, there's leasing when we lease a new vehicle. And then the other side of the business is the rental side or fleet, where we have uh, the rental car companies uh, doing a lot of activity, but they pulled back significantly during this recession. And of course, we have a uh, commercial fleet or other fleet as well. And what we can see is that retail activity has actually held up fairly well during this crisis. Uh, year to date, retail is only down a little over 11%, while other channels in the market are down substantially more. Uh, so I think one of the things that we're seeing emerge from this is that the uh, the retail consumer uh, has actually done fairly well in this environment. I think one of the things that we're learning is that the severity of this recession has you know, no doubt hit the U.S. economy uh, significantly, but it appears to not have hit new vehicle buyers quite as hard as it's hit other sectors of the economy. And I think that's why we're seeing that in general that uh, retail activity uh, has been holding up quite well. The other interesting thing that we're seeing out in the marketplace is that shares of the market have been changing dramatically and that retail share, share of market activity has changed. Uh, it's gone up over 7.4% uh, year to date uh, from where we were at last year, uh, taking it almost entirely from the rental market. That rental activity is gonna be weak through the course of the year. So the industry is gonna be relying heavily on retail as well as lease activity. But if we look on the next slide, we can see that uh, what's happening out there uh, is also happening within the loans themselves. And these are a few metrics that we watch closely uh, using our dealer track data. We can get an idea as to what are the 
the uh, the terms or the conditions that folks have been uh, contracting for when they purchase a vehicle. And just looking at monthly loan payment, we can see that uh, it's been coming down uh, in recent months, uh, but it's still up on a year over year basis from where we were last year. Uh, that monthly loan payment really kind of spiked a little bit during uh, the uh, uh, early days of this year, uh, but it's since been coming down. But we also can see some of the other metrics are really showing quite a bit of volatility. Uh, and you can see that spike from the depths of the pandemic uh, appearing in these other metrics. And the amount financed, you can see it really spiked uh, in a, during the April time period when we had those uh, zero for 72 and zero for 84 uh, offers out there. A lot of folks flocked to buy those pickup trucks and that's really uh, added quite a kink into many of these lines. Uh, the contract term took a big jump uh, in, during the April pandemic. Again, those uh, long-term loan rates that the manufacturers were, were offering, uh, you know, 84 month financing was relatively new to the industry and a lot of folks jumped on that. And the cash down requirement uh, uh, changed substantially. There was quite a bit less that happened during the depths of the pandemic. Now it's reversed itself and it appears to be back on a more normal uh, upward trend, uh, you know, cash down increasing just as we see the average vehicle price uh, going up. So we have seen that this pandemic did disrupt many of these metrics, but they do appear to be kind of reverting back to trend at this point. But the other inter interesting thing when we look at the next slide is that 0% financing has been a very important part of this uh, pandemic recovery phase. And what we can see here, this is our from our DTAS data, dealer track data, uh, the share of the market that is paying a 0% interest rate really spiked substantially during the depths of the crisis, jumped over 21%. Again, that's when those manufacturers right in late March and, and into April really ran with those zero for 72 and zero for 84 offers and consumers really uh, gobbled that up. But the industry has been backing away from those uh, low interest rates uh, since then and certainly aren't quite as aggressive as they were before. Uh, and that may mean that, that we may be looking at a bit of a headwind because uh, these 0% offers probably aren't gonna have the, the same uh, impact on the marketplace uh, that they did before because consumers have seen these before. Uh, so it is something to keep an eye on that we may not have uh, the ability to manipulate the market quite as uh, as quickly uh, and significantly as we did back uh, in April. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what's going on the leasing side of the business. Uh, again, these, these payments are just to kind of show you what we're seeing going on, but in general, a monthly lease payment has been trending down through the course of this year. Uh, but uh, I think the more important one is uh, in amount finance, you can see has been trending up again, along with that vehicle price, that's not surprising. Uh, I think the interesting one here though, is the purchase lease difference. What is the premium that if you're going to buy a vehicle, what's that monthly payment uh, over the monthly payment that you would do on a lease? And you can see that it's hovering around $100 right now. Uh, that is quite a premium for uh, purchasing a vehicle, uh, but it does suggest that there is gonna be some room for growth there in leasing. And as we go into the fourth quarter, uh, we know that that's a, a really heavy period for leasing activity. Uh, so there's little reason to expect that we're not going to see a strong leasing uh, during this coming fourth quarter. So that's really kind of a summary of what we're seeing out there. If we go to the next slide, though, I think it's important to point out that there's been a lot of moving parts out there and that when we try to evaluate what's been going on in the market, it's really difficult to isolate everything and all the different metrics without keeping in mind that a whole bunch of activity was going on simply because of government policy. And what I'm showing you here is a map of the United States retail sales activity uh, during the worst of the pandemic, essentially Mar March 1st through April 30th. And during this time, the whole nation's sales went down about 37%, but we can see that Pennsylvania, New York, California, they were down substantially more. Uh, Texas, a little bit in the middle, at down 23%. And then you had states like Arkansas, Montana, and Oklahoma, they were only down just a little bit. And so what we're seeing here is the impact of governors who actually shut down their state uh, due to COVID concerns, uh, like Pennsylvania, like New York. Uh, you can see that that had a huge impact on retail sales activity. <clears throat> In markets where governors did not shut down the, mar uh, the activity, Arkansas, Montana, you can see the vehicle sales actually held up quite well. And so if you're trying to get an idea of what was the impact of governors shutting down the market, well, Pennsylvania, New York can kind of give you an idea of what that would be. If you just wanna know how much did COVID itself or the fear of the virus maybe close down or slow down the market, I think Arkansas and Montana uh, can give you a taste of that. But if we go to the next slide, the other interesting thing is, is because certain states were open and other states were closed, we saw massive changes as to what makes up 
uh, uh, the market shares across the country and what states were gaining and what states were losing. And what we can see that there was massive changes in market share. And during the worst of the crisis, Pennsylvania, New York, California, were losing significant portions of market share. And who was gaining those markets? Well, te uh, Texas uh, gained almost 2% of market share. Uh, Florida, 1.3% market share. So there was massive things changing during the during the pandemic as to what's how the, the, the pace of sales across the country, uh, as well as in, in addition to where could you buy vehicles, uh, and that was having an implications on the market share itself. But as we go into the next slide, we entered into the recovery period, and we can see that just as things were changing during the, the pandemic when, when activity was closing, things changed dramatically when, when states began to reopen again. And many of the states uh, that lost regained a lot of the, lot, the ground that they had lost during the pandemic. Nationally, during this recovery phase, which I've identified as May 1st uh, through the end of August, sales were down about 15%. But you can see New Mexico, Georgia, Utah were down substantially more. Uh, and then you had Maine, Montana, and Nebraska not down uh, nearly a, a, as much as the nation. So again, the, the responses across the country were really quite varied. And as we go to the next slide, we can again see that this impacted market shares. And a lot of the states that won in the early days of the pandemic, like Texas, like Florida, uh, continued uh, on into the, into the recovery period to give that, gr that ground back up. And you can see the northeastern states like Pennsylvania and New York were regaining some of the lost ground that they had before. So I really just take you through this exercise just so everybody understands that there's a whole lot of moving parts that we've had so far in 2020 and trying to evaluate the success or failure of companies or products. You got to be a little bit careful because there's been a lot of moving parts uh, that were entirely out of the control of, of both the manufacturers as well as consumers. So with that, Andy, yeah, I'll hand it back to yeah. you. Thank you for that insight, Charlie. It's, it's really good to see uh, that data. And I think, you know, it's nice to see what the, the causes are. I think there's a couple of things that are very relevant to our finance industry. Obviously, you talked about longer terms, 0% um, interest. I'm wondering if you could share with the uh, team from AFSA here where we've seen rates more specifically, how it's been going, you know, how the, the rates have been going you know, for customers, FICO bans, and what the economic impact has been in uh, the finance industry from that perspective. So maybe take a look at that now on the next sure, slide. Sure, yeah, so if we, if we go to the next slide, I think that'll kind of give you an idea of what we're seeing out there. And this is a chart that's showing the distribution of what customers are paying in terms of their contracted interest rate uh, that we're able to measure here at Cox Automotive. So on the x-axis here, these are uh, the, the share of the market of who's paying a zero or less than a 2% interest rate, who's paying a two to a 4% interest rate, uh, all the way up on the far right, who's paying an interest rate of 15% or higher. And what we can see here is that in that zero to 2% interest rate range, it was really low. It started the year at less than 10% of the market uh, was paying a less than a 2% interest rate. But as the pandemic uh, unfolded and into April, you can see that that jumped to over 30% of the market. Uh, during the, the later spring and summer months, uh, that's when the industry went really heavy in low interest rate financing to really spur economic uh, activity and interest. And uh, I think in some regards, you can say it works because we did see that nice recovery uh, from the depths of April. But it may be revealing that uh, the, the customer base is changing out there. And if you look at uh, what I've got there in the box, uh, the share of the market that was paying a zero to 4% interest rate in January and March was about 36% of the market. By April, uh, in that April to, to September recovery phase period, it jumped to almost 52% of the market, almost a 16% increase in market share of folks paying less than 4% interest rate. And where did the, these sales be coming from? Who, who are they taking customers from? Well, we can see that that four to 10% range has fallen dramatically. It's lost almost 11% market share as well as the 10% plus, so you're close to, to subprime borrowers. So the composition of the customer base may be changing dramatically and that this recession has really impacted hourly workers and may be uh, suggesting that, that only the only folks left to buy in the market or the, or the majority of folks are those folks with the best credit. Uh, they probably have not been hit quite as hard during this pandemic. And if we just go through a couple, the next slide here, uh, I think we'll see that, uh, well, that the different brands may be uh, vulnerable uh, regarding their customer base because of the type of recession that we're having. 
It's hitting hourly workers aggressively. That likely means that lower FICO score customers are probably suffering uh, more than your higher, higher FICO score customers. And that means some brands may be vulnerable. And what this chart is showing is that Mitsubishi, Dodge, Nissan, this is the average interest rate of what their consumers or customers are paying when they purchase that vehicle. They have some of the highest interest rate customers in the marketplace. Those are the very customers that might be the most vulnerable uh, in the depths of this pandemic because of uh, the significant recession uh, that we're having. On the far right, though, you can see the, the other end of the spectrum, which is Subaru, Land Rover, uh, have some of the best credit customers out there in the marketplace. Uh, their, their average customer base is paying less than a 2% interest rate they may be insulated from this recession. They may not be quite as vulnerable because their customers have not lost uh, jobs in quite the numbers as some of the lower uh, credit, or excuse me, higher credit score uh, customers. And if we go to the next slide, it kind of reveals, I think, really just hitting the same point, but I think it is kind of interesting to see what share of customers are we talking about? And in red, this is revealing the portion of customers that are paying more than a 10% interest rate. And in green, it's what portion of customers are paying less than a 2% interest rate. And again, you can see Mitsubishi, Dodge, Nissan. I mean, Mitsubishi, almost 60% of their customers are paying more than a 10% interest rate. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have Subaru, Land Rover, where almost 60% plus of their customers are paying less than 2%. So really the point is just to suggest that uh, the customer base may be changing and who's gonna be vulnerable as a result of that uh, may be quite revealing as well. So it's just something uh, to be aware of. And, and the next slide on this, I think really just kind of makes the same point, but I think it's worth uh, to kind of conceptualize what's going on in the marketplace. And this is showing the average transaction price uh, overlaid with the uh, average purchase APR, the interest rate that folks signed up for. And there's probably two factors that are going on in the marketplace right now, that because of this recession uh, and concerns about the virus, consumers are seeking value. They're seeking lower prices. They're seeking ways to save money. Uh, they're seeking ways to reduce their risk exposure. All of that may be putting pressure uh, on the marketplace. And these brands in particular, they have very high price points. They may be under significant pressure uh, because customers are changing and what they're looking for out there in the marketplace. But in addition to that, the lending environment may be changing as well. And that there may be pressure coming from up above, pushing down uh, as lenders are seeking better FICO score customers. They want to reduce their risk. That may mean that lending to Mitsubishi, Dodge, Nissan, those, those brands that have a naturally higher uh, interest rate customer, or, or in many ways, a proxy measure of a low FICO score customer base, uh, they may be vulnerable. And so that's something to just keep in mind as you are, are looking at uh, this fourth quarter, that all of these moving parts out there, that there are some economic forces going on as well uh, that, that does put the different brands in different situations uh, going forward. And I won't, I won't go into detail on the next slides. It's really just the same analysis looking at the different segments, but we can see that uh, those will be in the deck if you wanna, if you wanna uh, reference those. Uh, but really it's just interesting to see that subcompact car and compact car, uh, those are two segments which are actually doing very poorly in the marketplace right now, even though they have the lowest prices in the market, uh, but their customer base is a very uh, low uh, FICO score, high interest rate customer base. So even though they got low prices, uh, it may be that that customer is getting hit particularly hard right now and isn't able to make uh, these purchases. So a lot of things going on out there, Andy. There certainly are a lot of things going on there. Uh, they'll, they'll be in the deck. So, if want to listen, them. Charlie, if, if, let's talk a little bit more about inventory. I mean, in talking to dealers today, you know, I talked to a dealer the other day and they're actually selling cars over MSRP, you know, because the inventory has been so tight. Um, the dealers are actually profiting from the, the lower inventory. I'm just wondering from our partner's perspective, um, you know, what are some trends we're seeing? Because because everybody hears that the new vehicle inventory is tight and used vehicle, these are all go, these are major factors in the financing and how we, how they set their pricing. Can you, can you spend a little time talking about what we're seeing with inventory and pricing for, and, you know, go through that for a little bit, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let's just jump into the next slide. And I think we'll see that, you know, what's interesting is, is that the new and used markets actually came back very strongly. Uh, what I'm showing on the left here is the rolling 30-day retail sales. And in light blue uh, is the used market and in dark blue is the new market. And you can see a nice V-shaped recovery for both. Uh, the used market though recovered very strongly and is now you can see the sales trend appears to be weakening 
uh, while the new market is actually a, a visually showing a little bit of a gain, but on a year over year basis, uh, it's actually kind of flatlining. And as you can see on the right, uh, looking at the change in sales from where they were a year ago, uh, we can see that uh, both the new and the used market uh, are in negative territory and are starting to stabilize there, that the market is kind of settling in at down a five to 10% range on the retail side. But what is interesting is, is that the retail market actually came back quite strongly at the same time that the supply of vehicles was essentially constrained. Uh, new vehicle supply essentially shut down in the months of uh, April and May and the tail end of March as the factories closed down. The industry got behind about 3.3 million units. Uh, that's a lot of inventory that was not created uh, because the factory shut down. And as a result of that, this early recovery that we had in vehicle sales, which actually started before many of the factories were even able to reopen, uh, drew down available inventories and it left uh, the industry in a very tight supply situation. As we see on the next slide, uh, we can see the day's supply has actually gotten quite low. Uh, on the left here, it's showing day's supply over the last year. Uh, and you can see that it's you know below uh, 60 days. Uh, and on the right, it's showing just the annual difference. You can see it's running about 20% below where we were last year. Uh, the concern we have going into the fourth quarter is does this supply situation mean that de the dealers out there aren't going to have the right products for what consumers are looking for? Do they have the right color? Do they have the right trim level? Uh, these are things that may force, if they don't, that some consumers may decide to wait uh, until they do have uh, what exactly they're looking for. And in addition to that, we know that the model year 2021s are behind schedule as well. There's just not as many new model year 2021s in the marketplace today as we had at this point last year with model year 2020s. Fourth quarter is a big month, particularly for the luxury market, or excuse me, a big period, particularly for the luxury market when a lot of folks are coming in to buy the latest and greatest. It may be a lot of dealers don't have uh, those latest and greatest products available. So that's just one more headwind that, that we're concerned about here at the end of the, of the year. And on the next slide, we can see the use side is also a uh, uh, very tight supply situation, but does appear to be changing uh, a little bit. Uh, you can see on the left here, the days of supply uh, available, uh, looking at the used market. Again, it spiked significantly during the crisis when all the dealerships, or many of the dealerships had shut down or across the country. Uh, but then once they reopened and sales really started to, to take off, we can see that supply and day supply was drawn down tremendously. But over the course of the summer, the strength that we've seen in the new market has seen an increase uh, in trade-in activity. And that's been able to mitigate uh, some of the uh, supply constraints uh, as well as the sales pace has slowed down a bit. So that's allowed the industry to catch up a little bit uh, on the day supply issue, but it still remains uh, relatively tight. And as we see on the next slide, when you've got a, a lot of demand out there and tight inventories, you're gonna get rising prices. And that's exactly what we're starting to see out there. The average list price in the used market has risen significantly uh, during the depths of the crisis. And on a year over year basis, you can see in red, uh, the trajectory looks very, very strong. Now we're starting to see some early signs uh, from the wholesale market, what we're seeing at auction, that there is gonna be a little bit of a reprieve on these rising prices. Uh, but at this point, as, as long as supply is staying tight uh, and demand remains uh, you know, relatively strong, uh, the vehicle price issue is gonna stay up there uh, and mean that many, many potential buyers are gonna be forced out of the market but certainly should allow dealers themselves to, main, to maintain fairly strong uh, margins on this. So that's what we're seeing in the inventory side out there. Yeah, it's interesting too, because in talking to some of the lending partners, there's a little concern about the LTV ranges getting to be a little bit larger due to the pricing, uh, since they can put the pressure on the consumer to put more cash down or to our lending partners to lend at a higher LTV ratio. Um, you know, like I said before in the beginning, let's let's just talk a little bit about the uh, upcoming election and, and sentiment. You know, can you share with us some of the data that we've learned? You know, we do a lot of studies on consumer sentiment. I know you've got some here as well or some other sources. Can you just share with the, the group from ASA here what we've learned about just consumer sentiment and the car buying experience and how it may or may not be impacted by the presidential election? Yeah, well, if we go to the next slide, I think you'll see that we know that consumer sentiment uh, is a very important part of the consumer buying process, 
Uh, consumers have to be confident about their economic circumstances. They have to be confident about the economy, confident about their job. Uh, you know, nobody wants to be taken out a loan for thirty or forty thousand dollars if they're worried about getting laid off in the next week or two. So, uh, you know, having confidence is an important part of the vehicle market, and that's what this chart I think really reveals. What I have on here in orange is showing the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index. They do a monthly survey of thousands of people. And this is the 12-month moving average of their index. And I've got about 40 years worth of data here. And I've overlaid the 12-month moving average of the new light vehicle sales star. And you can see that there's a very strong relationship between these two metrics, as we would expect, for the very reasons I was saying, that you need to have a certain amount of confidence uh, before you're going to go out and make a big vehicle purchase. There are some interesting nuances that are revealed in this line. Uh, one, you can see in the 1990s uh, that the, uh, uh, the light vehicle sales are, uh, stayed relatively high during this period I've called the incentive bubble. We saw sales stayed relatively elevated while underlying consumer sentiment fell dramatically. And this was in the early 2000s when we had the uh, dot-com bubble burst and we had a mild recession and of course the 9-11 attacks. The industry had long-term uh, agreements with the UAW. They had to build vehicles or pay wages, whether they built the vehicles or not. So they decided to go ahead and, and build vehicles, even though the underlying demand wasn't there, and just discount them heavily. And that's when we had this incentive bubbles period. Uh, but then we can see we rent, entered into the recession of 2009. Uh, all Both sentiment and, and sales fell. But then we had this nice recovery throughout the 2010s. And now you can see the most latest data points showing us heading back down again uh, as the pandemic hits. But clearly the key takeaway from this slide is that consumer sentiment uh, does appear to be some sort of a correlated predictor of what's going on with vehicle sales. But what we also know is that what makes up consumer sentiment is a mixture of the country. It's, it's uh, rich people, it's poor people, it's uh, employed people, unemployed people, and it's Republicans and Democrats. And if you look on the next slide, I think it's really kind of interesting. I looked at this data uh, over the last uh, couple presidents to see how does uh, consumer sentiment change when the underlying, uh, during the underlying presidential election. And what you can see here in red is what Republicans sentiment is, in green is the nation, and then in the, 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 yellow, the orange line I showed you on the previous page, and then in blue is what Democrats are seeing out there. And we can see that uh, prior to Obama getting elected, Republicans had a higher consumer sentiment uh, in red than the, than the blue line is, the Democrats. Once Obama was elected, we can see that this changed almost overnight. And now re uh, Democrats were much more uh, enthusiastic on the outlook. Republicans uh, saw their sentiment fall dramatically, yet the green line essentially remains fairly stable. You really don't see much nationally. And then all of a sudden, President Trump gets elected, and you can see that that red line just explodes, just jumps through, while the blue line falls down. Uh, Trump uh, supporters are, are ecstatic. Uh, the Republicans, uh, uh, their their level of sentiment uh, had never been higher. Uh, Democrats, on the other hand, had seen their sentiment fall dramatically. Yet, on the average, the blue, or the, excuse me, the green line doesn't move that much. So you really wouldn't see these underlying changes if you just looked at national consumer sentiment. So the, I make this point because what we have this election coming up in two weeks. Um, what may happen if we do have a, a new president elected? we may see massive changes in the underlying uh, uh, sentiment of the country. Even though the national number may not change much, folks who are Trump supporters may become in incredibly disappointed and, and pull back from the market as they have lower consumer sentiment. Uh, blue state people or, or Pre uh, Vice President Biden supporters may all of a sudden become more optimistic and wanna go out and make purchases. Uh, it may be that we see some product lines uh, could be more vulnerable and 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 have more to gain in this type of environment. Do truck sales fall uh, in certain red state markets if if President Trump doesn't win re-election? Re Do blue state buyers uh, get more interested in alternatives or electric electrics? Uh, again, I, we don't know the answer to that just yet, but I do think it's just important to point out that who may be coming into your uh, uh, businesses and who may be looking for a loan, who may be looking for a vehicle, may change substantially uh, come November. Uh, depending on how the uh, the election turns out. And certainly if President Trump wins re-election, uh, we may see that red line go even higher uh, than it is today. So it's just something to be aware of as we get prepared to the uh, what's coming up here later in the fourth quarter. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, 
Well, it, it will be very interesting to see what happens. And I'm sure this time next year, we'll look back and see how that, that is. But hopefully that green line stays high um, as we go forward. If we go to the next slide. I just want to wrap up. You know, We're at the end of our time here. I just wanted to, first of all, thank you, Charlie, for all those amazing insights. Um, I think it's really helpful for everybody in the industry to share that type of data. I just want to kind of reinforce some of the things. You know, As you saw, some trends are easy to predict, some are not. Um, we all know that the uh, economic impact has changed SAR, and obviously we can't control when a vaccine will be available and what that'll do, but you know, we're, we're keeping our eye on that to see what will change in our industry. Um, we know the election will have certain impacts to us as well. Um, we also know that our lenders are, you know, have been doing a great job at adapting um, what's going on, you know, working with their dealers, adapting to our industry that's changing. Um, some of the things we've seen in terms of, you know, online and digital retailing type of transactions. So really proud of our industry because I think we really adapted well, like we always do. Um, but with that, I just wanted to, maybe the next slide, we'll just, uh, you know, say our thank yous. And uh, if you guys have any email questions for Charlie, for myself, uh, please feel free to do that. We appreciate you taking the time to, to go through this uh, session. We also want to make sure that you're aware that we have tons of material um, from Cox Automotive on consumer sentiment studies, all kinds of information. You can reach out to someone, myself, Charlie, or, or one of the people you have relationships with, and we can share you all of our research and findings um, at all times. And you know, finally, in closing, I just you know I look forward to seeing everybody in person again. Um, you know, I know our industry is a, a great industry, and I thank everybody for their time and. You know, thank you for uh, visiting the Cox Automotive team today and, you know, best of luck and stay well to all of you and your families. Thank you very much and talk to you soon.